Well, here I am again, making another solution. Well, at least I'm trying. My oil and vinegar salad dressing is just not cooperating. I mean, look, I leave it for a minute and it's already separating. Of course, you've already learned that that's because oil is nonpolar, while acetic acid solution, that is vinegar, is polar, like dissolves like. And these two components are just not alike, structurally speaking. Well, guess what? There are actually several factors that affect the solubility of substances. In this video, we will take some time to consider what they are. Science is real from the Big Bang to the We are already familiar with the idea of molecular structure affecting solubility. Polar solvents will attract polar solutes, while nonpolar solvents will attract nonpolar solutes. It's all about the attraction. However, polar solvents' intermolecular forces are too strong compared to any competition that nonpolar solute particles can offer to really allow for any effective mixing, such is the case with oil and water. If I add a small amount of oil to a container of water, the mixture remains separated, even after agitation. The solute-solute attractions are just too different from the solvent-solvent attractions. Of course, we can use our knowledge of structure to help make two things that wouldn't normally dissolve mix it up. For example, look at this pan coated in oil. If I run water over this pan, it is not going to remove all of this oil. So, I add something that structurally is willing to attract all that nonpolar oil and the polar water so that it can all wash away. Have a myself, Mama. Brilliant. Here is a molecule of sodium lauryl sulfate, the soap found in many of your household detergents. Substances used for detergents work because they are large molecules that are mostly nonpolar with a strongly polar side to it. The nonpolar side is hydrophobic, while the polar side is hydrophilic. Let's imagine a dirty container. This circle represents a droplet of oil. Next, we add our soap. The sodium dissociates and floats away. The rest of the molecule is what really matters anyway. Of course, we wouldn't just add one soap molecule. We would add a bunch. The hydrophobic end of each of these molecules will start to find themselves attracted to the nonpolar oils and dirts. They will start to align the nonpolar ends toward the droplets of oil until they form lauryl sulfate pockets around the oil droplet. This pocket is called a micelle. Look closely at the outer edges of the micelle. The outer part of the sphere is all polar, which means all the water molecules are attracted to the micelle now and can easily wash it and the oil it surrounds down the drain. Another factor to consider when looking at solubility is temperature. See this mound of sodium acetate? I can make this entire mound dissolve in five milliliters of water, but not at this temperature. You see, right now, the energy required to space out those solvent water molecules is just too high to be met at room temperature. I could probably only dissolve about half of it before it becomes saturated. But if I heat this up to a high enough temperature, I can dissolve the whole thing. And if I'm very careful about letting it cool slowly without being disturbed, I can get the solution to become super saturated, which means all of this would be in solution at room temperature, at least until I do something to get it to fall out of solution. But I'll show you that in class. 
Temperature is clearly another factor that affects solubility. Chemists use graphs, called solubility curves, to decide how much solute can be added to a solvent at various temperatures. Notice temperature has a much more dramatic effect on some solutes than others. Just compare potassium nitrate to sodium chloride. Though both increase in solubility, sodium chloride's increase is very slight as temperature increases, while the potassium nitrate solubility increases dramatically. It is important to note that temperature does not always increase solubility. It can also have the opposite effect, particularly when you are talking about gases dissolved in water. The warmer the solution, the more space between the solvent molecules, allowing the gas molecules to maneuver up to the surface and escape the solvent net trapping it in solution. This becomes one of environmentalists' key concerns when considering thermal pollution caused by natural water sources used as cooling sources for industry or power plants. Warmer water amounts to less dissolved oxygen available to aquatic life along with some other issues. Look at this solution. This solution has a gas dissolved in it. If I open the bottle, the gas begins to escape decreasing the CO2 concentration in my soda. Well, no worries. There's still plenty in there. For now. The soda bottle is a demonstration of Henry's Law. Henry's law states that the concentration of a dissolved gas will be directly proportional to the partial pressure of the gaseous solute above the solution, or C equals Kp, where K is a constant associated with a particular solution based on the interaction between the solute and solvent particles that occur during solvation. So if I have a gas, such as carbon dioxide, dissolved in an aqueous solution in a sealed container, both the water and the carbon dioxide will reach a point of equilibrium when filling up the space above the aqueous solution, which we have previously called vapor pressure. Now, if somehow I increase the pressure in this space, perhaps by shrinking it, it will force more of the gas molecules back into the solution in order to maintain the appropriate vapor pressure for that solution at that given temperature thus increasing the concentration of gaseous solute actually dissolved in the solution. Now one quick side note. Henry's Law only works for dilute solutions when the gaseous solute does not react or dissociate once in the solution. Molecules like carbon dioxide, oxygen, nitrogen follow Henry's Law, while gaseous hydrogen chloride does not. Does pressure only affect solutions with gases? Correct. Pressure changes don't affect solutions involving solids or liquids nearly as dramatically as they do gases. In fact, let me take a moment to remind you that though we tend to talk about aqueous solutions most often in this class, there are many types of solutions, such as gases mixed with other gases, like air, gases mixed with liquids, like soda, Liquids mixed with liquids. Like rubbing alcohol! Remember, what makes them all solutions is that they are homogeneous and completely uniform throughout. There you have it! The three factors that affect the solubility of a solute in solution. Structure, temperature, and pressure. When we return to class, we will use these factors to predict some behaviors of solutes. We will also make sure you are all masters of interpreting solubility curves. See you in class. Science is real. From anatomy to tree.